God will judge the nations. And it's good news that God will judge the nations. Look with me at chapter 13, verse 9. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. And perhaps cast your eyes down uh, to verses 15 and 16 too. How can this be good news? Well, that was all I saw. If that was all as I had to say on, on the subject, it might look like it was a fairly arbitrary judgment, mightn't it? Uh, God might look capricious, uh, bad tempered in the extreme. But that's not the case. Uh, and of course, we should never rejoice, should we, at the eternal judgment of anyone? Not even our fiercest enemy, not ever. Uh, Jesus wept over Jerusalem, didn't he? Just before its inhabitants, Romans and Jews together, killed him on the cross. But here in Isaiah, the nations had had generations to turn back to God in repentance and faith. But they consistently refused. Generation after generation continued to rebel against God, despite his warnings. These are evil, ruthless people. Verse 11, uh, they are oppressors who, who had in anger struck down peoples with unceasing blows and in fury sub uh, subdued nations with relentless aggression. That's 14 verse 5. Uh, they, they'd greedily stored up wealth for themselves, ignoring the poverty of others. 15 verse 7. Uh, they were persistent idolaters. 16 uh, verse 8. And then 19 verse 3. They were occultists. And they were proud, believing that they were all self-made people. 23 verse 9. And this is how the nations had lived for generations. Generations upon generations, despite God's clear warnings to them. It's difficult to emphasise just how evil these nations were. Uh, their common practices included temple prostitution and, and child sacrifice. And God hated it. And I bet we're glad God hated that. He'd been patient and called the people to repentance. But over many generations, they'd persistently refused to come to him. Yes, over the years, some like Ruth had become believers. But the nations had institutionalised abhorrent, violent, deadly, sinful practices. It was in their DNA as countries. And so God's heavy hand of judgment fell on them. And that's good news, isn't it? Good news to get rid of all that awfulness. Don't we long for justice when evil abounds? Think of Hitler's Germany, Saddam's Iraq, Pol Pot's Cambodia, Armin's Uganda. We're grateful for justice, aren't we, that, that, that those have gone but justice was only brought about by God moving nations around uh, to implement his judgment on evil. Don't think that it was the allies that beat Nazi Germany all by themselves. That's proud to think that, isn't it? It was God who was judging evil. And I take it we pray for justice in North Korea, in China, in Syria and elsewhere. We long for justice, don't we, for the people of those nations. Yes, we pray for a softening of the hearts of, of Kim, of Xi and of the remnants of IS. But what if they don't repent or turn to God ever? What can we expect God to do? Leave it? Let them be? course not. God will one day bring about judgment on those nations just as he did on Babylon. These are nations that are implacably against God and his people. What happens to Christians? 
in North Korea. They get round, rounded up and, and sent to concentration camps, almost certainly to die. What happens to Christians in China? Well, increasingly, they're, they're having to log in when they get to a church to say that they've been there so that they can be monitored. And churches that don't allow that to happen are demolished and, and their pastors put into jail. What happens to Christians in Syria if they're caught by IS? Well, they're crucified, aren't they? We long for justice. God will one day bring about judgment on those nations, just as he did on Babylon. He'll bring those nations down if they refuse to humbly turn to him, if they continue their oppressive and murderous ways. Rightly, we long for justice and God will bring it about one day. And that's good news, isn't it? That God will bring an end to evil. But there's an even greater justice brought about by God's decisive judgments. Listen to how God describes the fall of Babylon in chapter 14. And as I read it, does it make you think of anything else in the Bible? Here we go. Chapter 14, starting at verse 12, if you're following on. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth. You who once laid low the nations, you said in your heart, I will ascend to the heavens. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly or on the utmost heights of Mount Zaphon. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. But you are brought down to the realm of the dead, to the depths of the pit. I wonder if that reminds you of anything else that happens in the big story of the Bible. Well, here's Jesus in Luke's gospel talking to his disciples. He said this, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And then in ultimately in Revelation, uh, Satan is thrown into a pit of fire, a lake of fire, thrown out of heaven and into a pit, just like Babylon. You see, ultimately, it's Satan who sits behind every evil in the world. And it's Satan who's defeated by Jesus on the cross. It is finished. He is judged for his rebellion against God and for the misery he's caused on earth ever since he tempted Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Here's Revelation 20, starting at verse 9. Uh, the nation Satan's deceived marched against the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulphur, where, he, where the beast and the false prophet had also been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verse 14. Uh, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. You see, judgment is good news, isn't it? Because Eventually, it's the end of Satan. It's the end of all evil. It's the, the end of all rebellion against, against our good and gracious God. That's quite a shift, isn't it, in our thinking? Uh, we often recoil at the idea of judgment, uh, not getting past the immediate human experience of it. And yes, people get caught up in judgment. And that's because we're all culpable for our sin. We're all culpable for not turning to Jesus if we haven't done that. We don't see the big picture of what's going on spiritually behind the scenes, do we? Because we get caught up in the human experience. God's judgment brings an end to evil. All evil. And evil is defined as rebellion against him. 
brings an end to suffering. It brings an end to all that's bad. And judgment even brings an end to death itself, doesn't it? Death is judged. It's got rid of. There will be no death in the new creation. God judges the nations and that's a good thing. But is it possible for those who are currently in rebellion against God, those who currently don't trust Jesus, to change sides? And that's what we'll think about when we come back.